let me ask you, I mean, there's a million ways to ask this question. I'm sure I'll ask it uh, about habitable worlds. Let's just go to our, our own solar system. What can we learn about the planets and moons in our solar system that might contain life? Whether it's Mars or some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, what kind of characteristics, because you said it might not need to be Earth-like, mm -hmm. what kind of characteristics might we, we be looking for? When we look for life, it's hard to define even what life is, um, but we can maybe do a better job in defining the sorts of things that life does. And that provides um, some aspects to, some avenue for looking for them. Um, in the classically, conventionally, I think we thought the way to look for life was to look for oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis on this planet. Um, we didn't always have it. Certainly if you go back to the Archean period, um, there was, you know, you have this period called the Great Oxidation Event where the Earth floods with oxygen for the first time and starts to saturate the oceans and then into the atmosphere. And so that oxygen, if we detect it on another planet, whether it be Mars, Venus, or an exoplanet, whatever it is, um, that was long thought to be evidence for something doing photosynthesis. Because if you took away all the plant life on the Earth, the oxygen wouldn't just hang around here. It's a highly reactive molecule. It would oxidize things. And so within about a million years, you would probably lose all the oxygen on planet Earth. So that was a conventionally how we thought we could look for life. And then we started to realize that it's not so simple because A, there might be other things that life does apart from photosynthesis. Um, certainly the vast majority of the Earth's history had no oxygen, and yet there was living things on it. So that doesn't seem like a complete test. Um, and secondly, could there be other things that produce oxygen besides from life? Um, a growing concern has been these false positives in biosignature work. And so one example of that would be photolysis that happens in the atmosphere. When ultraviolet light hits the upper atmosphere, it can break up water vapor. The hydrogen splits off to the oxygen. The hydrogen is a much lighter atomic species, and so it can actually escape certainly planets like the Earth's gravity. That's why we don't have any hydrogen or, or very little helium. And so that leaves you with the oxygen, which then oxidizes the surface. And so um, there could be a residual oxygen signature just due to this photolysis process. So we've been trying to generalize. And um, certainly in recent years, there's been other suggestions of things we could look for in the solar system beyond uh, nitrous oxide, basically laughing gas is a product of microbes. Um, that's something that we're starting to get more interested in looking for. Methane gas in combination with other gases can be an important biosignature. Uh, phosphine as well, and phosphine is particularly relevant to the solar system because there was a lot of interest for Venus recently. Um, you may have heard that there was a claim of a biosignature in Venus's atmosphere. I think it was like two years ago now. And the, the judge and jury are still out on that. Um, there was a very provocative claim and signature of a phosphine-like spectral absorption. Um, but it could have also have been some of the molecule in particular, sulfur dioxide, which is not a biosignature. So uh, this is a detection of a gas in the atmosphere yeah. of Venus. And, and uh, it might be controversial on several uh, dimensions. So one, how to interpret that, Two, is this the right gas? And three, is this even the right detection? Is this is, is there an error in the detection? Yeah, I mean, how much do we believe the detection in the first place? If you do believe it, does that necessarily mean there's life there? And um, what gives? How can you have life in the Venus's atmosphere in the first place? Because that's you know been seen as like a hellhole place for imagining life. But I guess the 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 counter to that has been that okay, yes, the surface is a horrendous place to imagine life thriving. Um, but as you go up in altitude, the very dense atmosphere means that there is a cloud layer um, where the temperature and the pressure become actually fairly similar to the surface of the Earth. And so maybe there are microbes stirring around in the clouds which are producing phosphine. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, this is fascinating. It's got a lot of us reinvigorated about the prospects of going back to Venus and doing another mission there. In fact, there's now two NASA missions, Veritas, and Da Vinci, which are going to be going back and before 2030 or the 2030s. Um, and then we have a European mission, I think, that's slated now, and even a Chinese mission might be coming along the way as well. So we might have multiple missions going to Venus, which has long been overlooked. I mean, apart from the Soviets, there really has been very little in the way of exploration of Venus, as, certainly as compared to Mars. Mars has enjoyed most of the activity from NASA's rovers and surveys. 
Um, and Mars is certainly fascinating. There's you know this signature of methane that has been seen there before. Um, again, there the discussion is whether that methane is a product of biology, which is possible. Certainly, that happens on the Earth, or whether it's some geological process that we are yet to fully understand. It could be, a, you know, for example, a reservoir of methane that's trapped under the surface and is leaking out seasonally. So the nice thing about Venus is if there's a giant living civilization there, it'll be airborne, so you can just fly through and collect samples. Yeah. With Mars and uh, moons of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, you're gonna have to dig dig under to find the civilizations, the right. de dead or living. Right, and so yeah, maybe it's easier then for Venus because certainly you can imagine just a balloon floating through the atmosphere yeah. um, that, or a drone or something that would have the capability of just scooping up and sampling. Um, to, to dig under the surface of Mars is maybe feasible-ish with, you know, especially with something like Starship that could launch, you know, a huge digger basically to the surface and you could just excavate away at the surface. But for something like Europa, um, we really are still unclear about how thick the ice layer is, um, how you would melt through that huge um, thick layer to get to the ocean, and then potentially also discussions about contamination. The problem with looking for life in the solar system, which is different from looking for life with exoplanets, is that you always run the risk of, especially if you visit there, of introducing the life yourself. Right? It's very difficult to completely exterminate every single microbe and spore on the surface of your, of your rover or the surface of your lander. And so there's always a risk of introducing something. I mean, to some extent, there is continuous exchange of material between these planets naturally on top of that as well. And now we're sort of accelerating that process to some degree. Um, and so if you dig into Europa's surface, which probably is completely pristine, it's very unlikely there has been much exchange with the outside world for, for its subsurface ocean, you are for the first time potentially introducing bacteria spores into that environment that may compete or may introduce spurious signatures for the life you're looking for. And so it's it's a, almost an ethical question as to how to proceed with looking for life on, on those subsurface oceans. And I don't think one we've really have a good resolution for at this point. Ethical. So you mean ethical in terms of concern for the like for preserving life elsewhere, not, right. like not to yeah. murder it, as, yeah. as opposed to a scientific one. I mean, so, we always <laughs> worry about a space virus, right, coming coming yeah. here or, or you know some kind of external source, and that we would be the source of that potential contamination or the other direction. Yeah, I mean, they that you know the whatever whatever survives in such harsh conditions might be pretty good at uh, surviving in all conditions. It might be a little bit more resilient and robust, so it might actually take a ride on us back home. Possibly, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure that some people would be concerned about that. I think we would. We would hopefully have some containment uh, procedures as if, if we did sample return. Or you mean you don't even really need a sample return these days. You can pretty much send like a little micro laboratory to the the planet to do all the experiments in you know in situ, and then just send them back to your planet the data. And so I don't think there's is necessary that especially for a case like that where you might have contamination concerns that you have to bring samples back. Um, Although probably if you brought back European sushi, it would probably sell for quite a bit with the billionaires in New York City. <laughs> so, <laughs> sushi, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would love from an engineering perspective just to see all the different candidates and designs for like the scooper for Venus and the scooper for Europa and, and Mars. I haven't really looked deeply into how they actually, like the actual engineering of collecting the samples because that's the engineering of that is probably essential for not either destroying life or or uh, polluting it with our own microbes and so on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's like an inge interesting engineering challenge. I usually for rovers and stuff focus on the on the robot on the sort of the mobility aspect of it, on the mm -hmm. robotics, the perception and the movement and the planning and the control. Mm -hmm. But there's probably the scooper is probably where the action is. The, yeah. the microscopic sample collection. So basically, you have to first clean your vehicle, make sure it doesn't have any earth-like things on it. And then you have to put it into some kind of thing that's perfectly sealed from the environment. So if we bring it back or we analyze it, it's not um, it's not going to bring anything else uh, external in. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it'd be, that'd be an interesting engineering design there. Yeah, I mean, Curiosity has been uh, leaving these little 
pods on the surface quite recently. There's some neat photos you can find online. And it's they kind of look like uh, lightsaber hilts. Which <laughs> So, um, yeah, to me, I, I think I tweeted something like, uh, you know, this weapon is your life. Like, don't lose it, Curiosity, yeah. because it's just dumping these little vials everywhere. And it's yeah, it is scooping up these things. And the intention is that in the future, um, there will be a sample return mission that will come and pick these up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I mean, the engineering behind those things is so impressive. The thing that blows me away the most has been the landings. Um, especially I'm trained to be a pilot at the moment. So that's the sort of, you know, watching landings has become like my pet hobby on YouTube at the moment and how not to do it, how to do it with different levels of uh, conditions and things. But with the, you know, when, when you think about landing on Mars, just the light travel time effect means that there's no possibility of a human controlling that descent. Mm-hmm. And so you have to put all of your faith and your trust in the computer code or the ai or whatever it is that you've put on board that thing to to make the correct descent um and so there's this famous uh period called seven minutes of hell where you're basically waiting for that light travel time to come back to know whether your vehicle successfully landed on the surface or not and during that period you know in your mind simultaneously that it is doing these multi-stages of um deploying its parachute deploying the crane activating its jets to come down and controlling its descent to the surface. Um, and then the crane has to fly away so it doesn't accidentally hit the rover. And so there's a series of uh, multi-stage points where any any of them go wrong, you know, the whole mission could, could go awry. Um, and so the fact that we are fairly consistently able to build these machines that can do this autonomously is to me one of the most impressive acts of engineering that NASA have achieved. 